President Biden is facing backlash for a controversial judicial nomination he made earlier this week. Jennifer Reardon, who was previously nominated to the federal bench by former President Trump, is a principal at Gibson Dunn, the law firm behind Chevron's corporate prosecution of environmental lawyer and activist Stephen Donzinger. Donzinger reacted to Reardon's nomination on Twitter, slamming Reardon as having been, quote, paid millions at Gibson Dunn to help jail me, attack indigenous peoples, and cover up a massive oil spill in the Amazon. Sledge reports that in her nomination documents, Reardon highlighted her extensive work in corporate law, including a case where she represented New York real estate company Lafrac against allegations that they had discriminated against tenants living with HIV AIDS. We got host of the Katie Halper podcast and co-host of the Useful Idiots podcast, Katie Halper, to weigh in. Katie, welcome to the show. So, you know, uh, it seems like, so she's being rewarded, right? So she was um, prosecuting Steven Donziger Again, uh, representing Chevron, um, now being rewarded. What do you make of this? Well, I think this is, you know, we could call this a segment uh, this week and nothing would fundamentally change, which I guess is one of the most honest statements that Joe Biden made, um, of course, behind closed doors to donors about what his presidency would be like. And we see this as clear once again, I mean, just the fact that he would renominate someone who is nominated by Trump, this is someone who constantly positions himself as a rejection of Trump, as a return to normal, as a return to normalcy, as a return to rule of law. We know that's not true, as we've talked about on this program. His pr prosecution, his persecution of Julian Assange is one example of how he decided to side with Trump over Obama. Uh, his decision to not drop the charges or not uh, reclaim the case uh, of Donziger so that it's not the corporate persecution and prosecution that it is. And just to remind people, Donziger uh, defended the indigenous people of Ecuador whose water was poisoned by Chevron. Uh, his reward for doing that, because what happened was that Chevron was actually, uh, uh, they were forced to pay um, billions of dollars, which they haven't paid. Instead of paying that, they went after uh, Donziger. And this is a corporate unprecedented corporate persecution and prosecution where a judge actually appointed uh, a, a firm because the f federal prosecutor's office declined to prosecute him. So he, the judge had to uh, appoint a firm to go after him. And this uh, prosecution has been condemned by the United Nations, by uh, Amnesty International, Greenpeace, by members of Congress, including Rashida Tlaib, who I want to give a shout out to because she blasted this announcement and Biden's decision to um, to uh, go with Reardon, Jennifer Reardon, who, again, I mean, she in her own defense, she pointed to the cases she pointed to where, as you refer to, defending a real estate company against um, allegations of discriminating against people with HIV and AIDS. Also, the the nonprofit work she cited, the pro bono work, was defending charter schools so they wouldn't have to pay their teachers a the prevailing wage. And this is the person who Biden decides is appropriate to to be a, a judge. This person who is already uh, nominated by Trump. It's really shameful. And I have to say, uh, Reardon donated to people like Rudy Giuliani, Chris Christie. But you know, bringing this home back to how beautifully bipartisan all this corruption is. Uh, she also was a huge donor to Gillibrand. And Gillibrand is cheering on the nomination of someone. And Gillibrand, again, presents herself as a progressive who stands with women, who stands with children. But we've now learned that she certainly doesn't stand with her constituent as the senator from New York. Stephen Donziger lives in New York. She's ignored his case, um, even though she allegedly represents him. But she doesn't represent him because she has major ties to not only Reardon, but she has major ties to Chevron. And she also... Um, stands on the side of big real estate when they're discriminating against people with HIV. She stands on the side of uh, the charter schools that try to exploit their teachers. So this is a shameful moment for everyone, basically, who is connected to this person. And it's 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 a real shame that it's a bipartisan issue. Sorry, that, I don't it's usually really go that long. Tell us how you really feel. Break, but, yeah, <laughs> I know. Sorry, I got emotional. <laughs> Even you in know, my Katie, notes, yeah. um, uh, um, it, it just it just reminds me of the fact that you know in 2020 um, more Wall Street um, donors gave money to Joe Biden than they did to Donald Trump, and, and I just think that that is such an important thing to keep in mind. You know, they didn't do that because they suddenly woke up and decided you know redistribution is fine, right? Yeah, Talk to us a little yeah. bit about I that about the bipartisan nature of members of Congress. 
Congress and, and the Senate, you know, believing they should be able to trade stocks, you know, and make millions off of private right. information and, and yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a real bipartisan sense of impunity, and you can't blame them because they don't face any consequences for this, right? So, again, you see these enrichment, self-interest at the cost of taxpayers, um, you know, members of Congress, senators really prioritizing their own special interests. And, you know, like, we on the left expect that from Republicans. Um, I, I guess we should be grateful in some ways to Democrats for making it so apparent that they, they do this also. Um, and, you know, again, this is just a, a I'm just so embarrassed. I mean, luckily, I wasn't a big cheerleader for Joe Biden, so I don't have a lot to be embarrassed <laughs> by. But it is just so shameful that this guy, I mean, watching all, everyone defend anything that this guy does um, when it's something that if Trump did, ima imagine how people would respond to this mm -hmm. if Trump had nominated her. I mean, I'm sure if it got as far as it did with Biden, they would have been up in arms as they should be. But again, this is business as usual. This is nothing would fundamentally change. Um, and we see when it comes to corporate interest and corporate donors and the environment, I mean, there's a slight difference between Democrats and Republicans, but not nearly as uh, as big as it should be. And it's just inexcusable. And this is the I mean, this is the planet we're talking about. I don't know if Democrats think that their kids are going to be on some other planet uh, if they have some plan that the rest of the world isn't going to be subjected to. And they're, I get they're just going to not have stuff. kids. They think it's wrong to <laughs> yeah, have them, I, right? I guess, so it's, yeah. It's, but some of them already have them, and they don't know what their kids are going to do. What if they have grandkids, <laughs> you know? But it's just a uh, it's just a sad state of affairs. And, um, yeah, I, it's, it's pathetic, and it's shameful, uh, and everyone should be upset about this, and Biden should be ashamed. And really, Gillibrand, again, because she especially again, positions herself as this progressive who stands on the side of the disenfranchised women, children. She's done some good work. I mean, she's done some good work around sexual assault in the military, for instance, um, and some women's issues. But you can't really pick and choose if you're a progressive. You can't stand with corporations. You can't stand with um, people who are destroying the planet and then also call yourself a progressive. Is it simply that the Biden administration, they don't fear progressives, so they can nominate people like this because what are you going to do about it? Do you think yeah. that's what oh, it is? Yeah. What do they, they say that Republicans um, fear their base and, and Democrats uh, disdain them or something? Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that's true. Mm -hmm. And we have to figure out on the left what, how we're going to have any leverage um, because well, we don't. And this is just really right part now. for the courts. I mean, the courts, the courts have been pro-business for so long. I mean, we, we always in the what makes the news, of course, are all of these civil rights issues. And, you know, we want to talk about Roe v. Wade or we want to talk about, uh, you, you know, a, a variety of things that that do affect our lives. But a lot of what gets ignored is the fact that the courts just continually side with big business over and over and over again. So this appointment actually, to me, doesn't it, it isn't surprising. Uh, you know, people always think that it is, like you mentioned before, kind of going back to that, that Republicans, you expect this from them, you don't really expect it from Democrats. And that is completely true. You know, with, with Republicans, th what I at least appreciate about them is that they're not lying to us about yeah, who they represent. Or, about this thing, yeah. Right. Yeah, you know, they, they say, look, we're we're about business, we're about this, we're about that. And so they're at least honest about who they represent. Um, but Democrats have always said, no, we're for the people. And then they go and right. put in very, very pro-business judges. I would be interested to find out if there was a way, and I don't know if you know this, but um, if, if we know what percentage of justices that are actually appointed to the bench come from private law firms versus coming from representing the people, you know, who was right, representing the people versus who. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, I'd be really have, interested to find yeah. out what that percentage is. Well, yeah, someone should gather those. I mean, I don't think there are a lot of, of people coming out of the, the I mean, what, what happens also is if, if you make it far enough, even if you are, let's say, a public interest lawyer, you're not going to be able to really represent those interests once you make it high up enough in the food chain. Uh, we see this a lot. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, you know, uh, it, it's inter it, I guess we shouldn't be that, you know, we're going back to what you just said, Kim, it's it's Republicans. They they pretend that they're they're the party of big business of, of well, they like to pretend they're the party of small business owners. That's their shtick. Right. But they what mm -hmm. they say is that they're the party of people of the people, but through representing in business interests, right? So their thing is like trickle down. That's how they do it. Whereas Democrats pretend that it's through labor movements. They claim that they're anti uh, corporation. Um, 
But, you know, again, we sh- we also shouldn't be that surprised. I mean, Biden is someone who really facilitated the uh, the rise of Clarence Thomas. I mean, people may may not know this, but he when he was on the uh, uh, Senate committee really, you know, helped kind of slut shame Anita Hill. He didn't allow other witnesses to come forward. And uh, he was a big champion of Clarence Thomas. So his, his uh, record when it comes to, to judges isn't stellar. Katie, where, well, and where he also hails from on... Delaware, the most pro-corporate oh, yeah. right. state in the union. So, right. um, Katie, I was going to ask you, where do you stand on the kind of the realignment talk, like the idea that there's sort of more in common between populists on the right and pro-labor progressives than either of them has with the more corporate wing of each of their parties? Do you, do you think that there's any room there for a realignment? I mean, that people talk about that a lot. I'm not sure what the realignment looks like. I do think that there are definitely ways that people can reach across the aisle. I mean, I think of someone like Bernie Sanders, right, who whose populist message was able to reach both sides. And to me, you know, there is some for me, there's some problematic messaging that comes from the populist right. Um, but I think that the strength of someone like Bernie Sanders and the strength of someone who is a left populist is that they can speak to people's frustration and anger. And, you know, I, I'll simplify it a little bit. But for me, it's kind of like one side says, I feel your pain. I know you're hurting. Blame immigrants. Uh, with Trump, it was certainly blame Muslims and Mexicans, right? Very overtly. And then you have the Bernie side saying, yeah, you're, I feel your pain. I know you're hurting. Don't blame um, Muslims and Mexicans. Blame corporations. Uh, so I see there, I, I, I think that there's a, a way that people can kind of like uh, fight to, to change people's perspectives, but m- like both meet them where they're at, but then bring them hopefully to the left, which will probably upset some of you on the panel, but that's my plan. <laughs> I, I say, I feel your pain. Things are bad. I'm with you. I blame the government and you should too. So <laughs> yeah, right. We right. all think the government deserves a little bit of blame, right? Nobody. Like, yeah, yes. right. It's just yeah. a question Killing of, people of, around of, the world. how... Yeah, but the question is, like, you know, this we see this like, okay, the government is is doing bad things, but the solution isn't letting you know big business take these things over because they certainly right. don't have their hearts in the right place either. But I would argue that Bernie Sanders has lost the populist plot. I mean, I myself categorize myself as a populist, and I I definitely agree with people on both sides of the aisle. I have some very left wing friends and some very right wing friends, and <laughs> but we're all populists, and we seem to definitely agree on a lot of things. But I would say that the Bernie Sanders wing has a, has has shifted towards away from, I would say, blame the corporations and more towards blame racists. And that has been one of the big problems that many of us have had with this is that you're just pointing the finger again at another group of people who are suffering, you know, and calling them names and saying, well, you must be a racist if you have a complaint, rather than listening to their grievances and saying, we got to fix this. Poor white people, poor black people, poor brown people, poor everybody have all of these very similar things in common and they're being ignored and instead separated by both sides, like you say, Katie. But I would say also now also coming from the left as well. I mean, I think there is a weaponization. On one side, you kind of have a weapon, well, a weaponization of identity politics and a weaponization of, uh, which, I, which I don't oppose. I mean, for me, identity politics means just recognizing that people have both different interests, but over intersect, also intersecting and overlapping interests and that those things can unite us as opposed to divide us. Yeah. Um, I think that's really what what should happen. I mean, I think that yeah. there are some people who do that on the left, but I also think that the real leftist position, and we do see this, I, I would say, from Sanders consistently, is not to just dismiss anyone uh, who is a Trump supporter as a racist. But again, and look, there's some people who I think that you'll never reach, but there are a lot of people you can reach. And I think that we can't really afford to write people off. And I think that we've seen this like a t- teachable moments where people say things that are we saw this in a town hall years ago with Bernie Sanders. I remember being kind of like amazed by it. But someone on the panel said something anti-immigrant. And he basically in a minute was like, well, do you think that uh, who should be blamed for this? The corporations? And, blah, blah. and the one was like, oh, okay. yeah, you're right. You're right. That's so a that's we we got to leave it there. We've got to leave it there. Katie, thank you so much thank for joining you. us. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. We have more rising coming up. Stick around. <laughs> 